morning, everyone. So uh, let's get started here. Um, just some quick comments on the assignment. A few emails, a few questions um, have made me start to realize that the level of what this course is versus what you're used to is actually quite different. Um, I want you to understand this quite carefully because this is going to be an important deal for you now and for the rest of this year, academic year, not just in my courses. Fourth year, these are core electives. You're about to start going out and work. The questions in the assignments have a level of ambiguity and open-endedness to them very, very intentionally. So sometimes when it comes to multiple potential correct options, don't, and you're questioning which, what's, what's he looking for? What's he looking for? Am I going to get this right? Okay, that's not the way to be thinking about it. It's like, I know what this is. I'm going to state it with my assumptions and explain my thinking. That's what we're looking for. Okay, so if there's ambiguity there, pick a side, go for it, write it down, explain it. If the information was never taught in class before, that's normal. You need to be looking it up. There's library resources. There's Perry's that I've posted the link for on the course website. There's Google. There's a variety of resources for you. Okay? So all of that is expected. If, you, if it looks like the question is something we've not covered in class, it probably is because we haven't covered it in class but it's related to this concept. So this idea of being able to learn on your own is really, really critical. Okay. So please, please accept that as a normal part of, of final year, fourth year, and elective courses, as well as just the normal part of regular life when you start working. Okay. So there was one clarification. People had, had a hang up there on question one on what's the principle of separation. Okay. Let's take a look at distillation, for example. What principle is distillation exploiting? Difference in boiling points. Difference in boiling points or volatilities. Okay? So same for the orange juice example. So when you're looking at that, is what is the physical principle that's being exploited to cause the separation? That's what I'm after. Okay, is that clear? Okay, so let's, uh, let's take a look at today's section. I just want to go back to this equation over here. Again, this is so important because even though what we, s we noticed in the class last week is with hindered settling, this equation does not apply anymore. <coughs> but with hindered settling, that general concept in that equation still applies, right? With hindered settling, larger particles, dp, are still going to settle faster. Larger density differences are still going to cause faster velocities. Okay? So that principle holds. It may not, not be the numeric value that holds, but the directionalities implied by that equation very much hold. And the other key difference, uh, other key point I wanted to emphasize from that equation is that velocity v over there, maybe a more correct way to write it is v relative which is the difference between the velocity of the particle going down, okay, and then there's the velocity of the fluid up. Okay. So if the velocity of the fluid up, the fluid is perfectly static, then that velocity that you're calculating there is the velocity of the particle. Okay, so V relative can simply be seen as V particle minus V fluid. Let me show you a really, really interesting separator that exploits that difference. Okay, here's a great little video. There's no sound, so I'll be the voiceover. Um, so this device is called a lamella, and it's got packs of slanted plates over there. Maybe let's adjust the lighting a little bit. Okay, and you're going to see in a minute how that sludge funnel accumulates the solids. The liquid overflow, the clear liquid is going to flow out there at that outlet point, and there's your inlet. Okay, so that's your mixture of solids and liquids going into the separator. So what trajectory is that solid particle going to follow? That solid particle is being forced downwards with the liquid, but then take a look at what happens when that curve happens. So that curve breaks the momentum of the particle and of the fluid 
And now watch the velocity profile or the trajectory of the solid particles. So most of the solids will be just pushed down, but some of those smaller solid particles, the larger particles will settle quite readily. The smaller particles are the ones that we want to separate out from. So in these channels, you've got those solid particles flowing upwards with the velocity of the liquid. Okay, so there's an upward velocity or a diagonally upward velocity from the liquid. That particle wants to settle down in that direction. Okay. So that's a terminal setting. So you can calculate the net rate that that particle is moving at. So there's two forces operating on that particle, gravity as well as the fluid flow. And so that particle has a net diagonal direction, actually in the upwards direction, but at a steeper diagonal to the fluid. Okay? So that's, this company is exploiting the, those two forces to make sure the particle collides with the sidewall and is collected and drops down. So it's kind of interesting. No moving parts in this device. Really robust engineering. All it needs is a pressure force to move the, the liquid solids through there. Right? So it's a really, really cool separator when you've got no electricity. When you need uh, a separator that will work in a region where there's no electricity and needs to operate robustly with no moving parts that need to be broken down. Okay? So it's just an interesting exploitation of these sedimentation rules. Now, what we did say in last class is that velocity that we calculate there in that theoretical equation is not used in hindered settling. In hindered settling, our particles are moving in a velocity that's different, and the only way we can calculate them is by measuring the ve settling velocity in a cylinder. So I showed you a video last week you saw how that interface drops down, and that interface in the, in the cylinder will drop down at a certain velocity. And that's the velocity we're going to use in the design equations today. So let me, let me go back then. To, we'll start here at slide 37. Essentially, the, the key point I want you to take from this is, from the moment we allow those solids to settle, during that free settling period, the height of the interface drops at a fairly linear rate, and then the solids are all compacted at the bottom. Okay? So there's your velocity right there, the V. You don't need to go to a theoretical equation anymore. Simple lab experiment in a cylinder with your flocculant or coagulant added, you observe that cylinder, you can get that settling velocity V. And the important point that was made in the video, and I've made it once or twice, is that that velocity is independent of the diameter of the cylinder. If I go repeat this experiment in a wider cylinder or in the actual vessel that I'm finally going to build, I'm going to get that same settling rate. So that V stays. So one thing that we want to bear in mind then, if we look now at that unit, I described the operation of that unit, and actually maybe let me pause here at this point. Tell the person next to you how that unit operates. What's going on in there? So recap for yourselves quick. No discussion over here. You guys all know how it works? Do you want to tell me how it works? Okay, so the, 
diagram is a typical cross-section of a sedimentation vessel. We've got liquids and solids coming in the feed line over there. And on a continuous basis, those solids settle down. On a continual basis, we're withdrawing here what's in the underflow, mostly solid stream with liquid. Those solids are not going to flow on their own unless there's some liquid with it. So this is a predominantly solid stream with, with liquid. And in the overflow is mostly clear liquid. There'll be very fine, dissolve, uh, fine solids still in suspension over there unless you get really perfect separation. But a good assumption is that most of your solids coming in in the top leave at the bottom, okay, if this unit is operating properly. It's a very good assumption that 100% of your solids are leaving at the bottom. There's a very small error that you make due to the solids that still are so small they remain in the overflow. Okay, so we can do a mass balance on that unit quite nicely from the solids perspective. Solids coming in over here, which we know, we know our feed flow rate, we know the feed concentration of solids, that same amount of solids has to be leaving at steady state out the bottom again. So one thing I want to emphasize is that dashed red line. That's a theoretical line. I want you just to visualize that cross-sectional area. So if we were looking at it from the top, you are seeing this cross-sectional area all the solids in the system that come in, in the feed, must pass at some point through that hypothetical plane. All the solids must move across that unit, uh, ac across that surface area. Okay, so that's the surface area of my tank. Now there's a little bit of an error here because actually in the middle we've got a piece where we're feeding the material into. So that area is eliminated. But in general, that area, this area given by capital A, is the area through which all the solids must pass. And what we define is a term that we're going to hear over and over in this course, and I expect that you've heard it before. We're going to define the term flux. And you can get a heat flux, you can get a mass flux, a flux simply says how much material is moving through a given unit area. So flux has units of, if you were dealing with energy flux in heat transfer, I'm sure Dr. Hoare has spoken about heat flux, it's joules per unit area. If you're talking about mass flux, we're talking about kilograms per unit time per unit area. We're going to see fluxes regularly in this course. So here's the mass flux of the solids. All the solids have to pass through that unit area. The nice thing is about this flux is we know that numerator. We, we, we do know it. We know how many kilograms per unit time we're feeding into that device. So at steady state, we're feeding in a certain mass flow. All of that mass has to pass through that hypothetical area and all of that mass has to pass at steady state out the bottom again. We also know the denominator. We know once we've built this unit what area that unit is. Okay. And because we're going to use this so regularly we're going to give it a symbol. And now here's why mass flux is so important for us and the velocity is so important. Because we're going to call that flux and break it down into two parts, C naught times V. Where C naught is the concentration of the solids. From a mass balance we can write C naught is the concentration of the solids. I'll put, put it up here on the next two slides from now. Concentration of the solids in the feed. So it's kilograms of solids in the feed per unit time. Uh, sorry, per meter cubed. Okay, not per unit time. So that's the, the mass of the solids per meter cubed of feet. So it's a concentration. And then V is that velocity in meters per second or meters per unit's time. 
Okay, and so if you multiply those two together, C naught times V, so shown here in this, uh, the next slide, 39, kilograms of solid per meters cubed times meters per second, and if you simplify those units, you get units of flux. Kilograms of solids per unit time in the numerator and surface area in the denominator. Okay, so one of those we know. We know C naught. That's easily known. We design our units to treat a certain mass flow, a mass concentration of solids. And then V, we can calculate in the lab. The product of those is equal to the flux. Another term that we see in the wastewater treatment literature for flux, they give it a different name, same thing, loading rate. So you, may have, you, you will definitely hear loading rate if you work in the wastewater treatment. Okay, and some people will work with the inverse of that. And the reason why they work with the inverse of it is because it has a good interpretation. It's what unit area do you require to treat a given amount of mass? Okay, so that's often used in design for these units. They'll work with one over the flux. Okay, any, any questions on that equation over there? Yes? Yeah. Um, what are the rotating rakes Okay, good question. What are the rotating rakes doing? Any suggestions? Sean? Sorry. They scrape the sludge down. They scrape the sludge down. Scrape the sludge down towards the, the bottom. What they also do is they end up creating channels. So as they rake through, they create channels to allow more solids to come to come fill those, those channels after the rake moves. They've left a hole and then the solid is now. So it never no, it moves incredibly slowly. Yeah, this is not an agitator. This is a, a rake to, as Sean says, to encourage the solids to go to the, to the underflow. Okay. As we'll see in a minute, the energy requirements for one of these units is very minimal. You have a very simple motor there that slowly moves that rake around, and that's the only mechanical part. Okay. The only thing is, you never want it to get stuck. If that happens, you literally have a pile of solids to clean out there, which do not smell very pleasant. Um, so yeah, you'd want to make sure that that motor does not stop and get stuck. OK, so there, um, there we go with the idea of mass flux. Now, we can also look at this from the perspective of the definition of mass flux. So remember, mass flux is mass feed rate per unit area. Well, we can write that in another way. So mass feed rate per unit area. Well, let's do the easy one, per unit area. There's my area. But another way that I can write my mass feed rate is by saying Q times C naught. Q is the volumetric feed flow rate to the unit of the, yeah, so meters cubed of feed per unit time. Okay. Multiply that by C naught. C naught has units of kilograms of solid times meters cubed of feed. So if we multiply Q by C naught, we now get kilograms solids per meter cubed of feed. And then you get back to what we had there as the definition of the units of flux. Kilograms of solids per unit time per unit area. Okay. So there's an alternative definition for flux. C naught times V or Q times C naught over A. Now, some of you are already saying, like, that can simplify a little bit, right? You can see a C naught there on two sides. Can we simplify that a little bit? Yes, absolutely. You can write Q over A is equal to V. Okay. Or rearrange that a little bit more.
into a form that we will likely use for a design perspective. If you want to know what surface area you need, you need to know the volumetric flow rate divided by the settling velocity. Okay, everyone clear on that? Relatively straightforward. That's, this is as complicated as the section gets. The velocity equation we derived last week and the flux equation we derived this week. We can do quite a lot with that. Let's take a look at how you can design a settler very approximately right now. So you're going to the lab and you're responsible for calculating the settler area. What you do is an experiment where you watch the interface drop by a certain amount in a graduated cylinder. So you see a drop from 500 milliliters on the cylinder to 215 and it takes four minutes to drop. Okay. I don't really actually care about the answer that you're going to get. I'm, in fact, I'm telling you what the answer is. I want you to spend five minutes and plan, explore, and oh, sorry, define, explore, and plan your approach to this. So as I said in this course in the first class, I promised you I was going to show you how to use this method on simple problems. It will get progressively more difficult. We had a really simple one last week. Now we're stepping it up a little bit. Take a few minutes. It's, this is not as straightforward as it might look initially to first define your problem. What is your goal? What do you know? So by that we mean figure out your aim. What do you know? what you don't know, and really important, draw a picture. That always helps if you're stuck with a problem that you're not sure where to go. So those are some of the four steps that you'll do in the define stage. Then explore. Okay. By explore, I mean what assumptions do you use? Which equations? Or theory do you use? Okay. And then plan your approach. So no calculators. Spend five minutes just doing those three steps and work with the person next to you if you feel comfortable doing that as well.
So if you've got your plan set up and you're finished with that already, feel free to go ahead and do your calculations and see if you can uh, get those same answers that are up there. Any questions so far? Any doubts, concerns? This problem looks straightforward. Something that you're unsure of? Is that factor of two a common number? Is the factor of two a common number? By what standard? By what standard? Okay. It's, it's an over-designed factor. Factors of two are not uncommon. Um, whether it's normal for this area, I'm not 100% sure. Okay, let's take a look at this. What's our aim? <clears throat> What's my aim with this problem? Okay, I'm going to ask for some responses and feedback. What are we trying to solve here? <coughs> diameter. Okay, so we want tank diameter. <coughs> which is related to the area A. What do we know and what don't we know? Yeah. Do you know the volumetric flow rate? Volumetric flow rate. OK, what else do we know? We're given enough information to find V, but right now, as there, we don't have V. So I would actually call it an unknown. We'd figure out, we put V down in our plan, right? So V is an unknown. What else are we given? Yeah, so that Q over there. Okay, so Q and then enough information from the vol to calculate V, but we're not given V explicitly. Draw a picture. What you have, should have in mind is a graduated cylinder, and at 500 milliliters, we put our material in, and it settles down to 215, though this cylinder itself is 300 millimeters tall. Okay, so there's a picture of the system we're dealing with. That interface of solids settles down to 215. So that's our picture, our aim, our knowns, our unknowns. That's the entire define step. Let's look at the explore step. Explore step refers to exploring issues around the problem. What do we assume is happening here? What equations? might be relevant to d explain. So once you've figured out what's happening here, which equations and tools might you use to start de describing the system? So always when I do this, the, this step in the class, it's very artificial. Because when we do the explore step, it's just after I've taught you that theory. So it's kind of obvious that the theory we're going to be using applies to that problem. But later on, in a midterm or two, three weeks from now when you're doing an assignment, you're not going to be sure which theory applies. Okay, so when we take a look at that explore step here, some of the things that should be coming to mind during the explore step, and just simply write out bullet points, is maybe say, assume, is it, do we have to assume hindered settling or are we told it's hindered settling? We can assume hindered settling because we're doing this in a cylinder, right? So, and we're doing it in a cylinder to calculate that velocity V because we've got no other theoretical way to calculate it. So assume hindered settling. Any other assumptions we could be making here? One important assumption is that that velocity, as it settles from 500 to 215, is constant. 
Right? So remember that lab-based example I showed earlier, that declining velocity over there is constant over time. So we're in this period. In other words, we're not moving out into that period over there. So over that four-minute period, this interface is settling at a constant rate. Would be another important assumption to make. Not stating these assumptions indicates that you really haven't understood the material. If you just go ahead and use the equations without recognizing their limitation, um, shows only a partial understanding of what's going on. Yes? Right, so assume well mixed so that at 500 millimeters we're, we're seeing that interface drop. So well mixed initially. Okay, what is our plan going to look like? What order are we going to do these calculations in? Yes. Okay, figure out the depth or the height, you could say, that it dropped. Okay, once you know the height that it dropped, then what are we going to do? Find the velocity. Find the velocity. And then once you know the velocity, what are you going to do? Find the height of... Yeah, so we found this change in height. From the change in height, you can calculate the velocity. Okay, we know that that change in height occurs over four minutes, so we can calculate the velocity. Then what are we going to do? Required area, for the flow rate given. required area for the flow rate given. So which equations are we going to use then? Okay, so we might use this equation over here. A is equal to Q over V. Where does that design factor come in, that design factor of 2? We were asked in the problem to assume an over-design factor of 2. Where, where are we going to apply that? Okay, so maybe we calculate the diameter as 5 meters and then say just double it. This. Okay, so we've got to account for that seven meters squared. One suggestion. <coughs> okay, the, uh, the one proposal is maybe divide the area by two. <laughs> okay, so there was the, um, sorry, your name is? Michelle. Michelle pointed out that we should over-design on a factor of two based on the settling rate, not on the area or the diameter. So the over-design should be applied to the settling rate. The settling rate refers to the velocity V. Okay, so we've got these particles settling at a velocity V. Do we double that velocity or do we halve that velocity? Suggestions to halve, yeah? Okay, when we over-design, what does the, the term over-design imply? Overestimating the parameter, you're going to make the unit have greater capacity than it would need otherwise than based on theory. Okay, so you get a theoretical calculation. You want to make sure that the unit is bigger or larger or oversized in whichever parameter is relevant to make sure that it's, it's, it can handle that capacity and more. Okay? Why do we apply over design? 
why do we over-design here based on a factor of two on the settling rate? Why might we do that? Yes. Input isn't always constant. If it's a waste management or something, it could be an influx of waste. Right, so our input isn't always constant. So we're designing this for a given waste stream of 2,100 liters per minute, but who knows next year what our requirement is going to be for that unit. Okay. What the particles separating in that unit, we're assuming that they settle at that velocity, so what that velocity is calculated there for you, 42 millimeters per minute. What happens if those particles settle faster than that? Are we going to run into problems in the future? If in the future my particles start settling at 60 millimeters per minute, am I going to have a problem in the future? Nope. Okay, so if they're settling faster than 42, it doesn't matter. In fact, our vessel is simply going to be just too big. If they settle at 20 millimeters per minute, that's when we're going to have a problem. So now if they're settling too slow, our system is going to have a problem. So we over-design in engineering processes to compensate for our uncertainty and to simply build in a safety factor for ourselves. So when it says here over-design by a factor of two based on the settling rate, it means that whatever settling rate we've calculated over here, go in a direction that's two times in the worst possible way. And the worst possible way is that those particles settle slower, not faster. So take that velocity and divide it by two and design your process then instead of settling at 42 millimeters per minute here in the denominator, put in 21 point something millimeters per minute. Yes, Brandon. In this case, is that the same? It is the same as multiplying the area by two in this case, <laughs> but not guaranteed. Okay. It's not the same as multiplying the diameter by two. Okay. So let's write up our plan then. So I've, I've did all the plan verbally there quickly. Um, let's just quickly look at some bullet points then for the plan. Is calculate the H drop, the height drop in the cylinder. Okay, that's very easy. You can just do, do, use a ratio over there and show that it's 171 millimeters that it dropped. Once you calculate the H, the height dropped, calculate the velocity, which is equal to H divided by 4 minutes. Over design. What over design says is V should be whatever your V was previously, divide by 2. You can make a note here, go in a worse direction. Okay. Emphasizing that you understand that halving the velocity is going to make the system operate worse. Your particles are moving at half the settling rate. Once you have that velocity V, you can then, your next step, calculate A, which is Q that you know divided by V, which you also know. So you know Q, and you know V, and you're done. Okay. Then let's just come back to that idea of the seven meters squared. There's seven meters squared in the middle. So remember that draw drawing I showed earlier, we've got our settling tank, and in the middle you've got a, a piece that's blocked off where the feed comes in. Right, so that 7 meters squared is used by the feed. Well, we've calculated that we need um, a certain area, so we need to add an additional 7 meters cubed to it. So whatever area you calculate then, so the area final is equal to Q over V. Just simply add an additional 7 meters squared. So just giving yourself that extra area to account for the part of the tank that you cannot use. Okay, then after that is you plug in, you use your calculator and you're done. Okay, that's, I'm not going to go through that. The, the, in fact, the answers are up there on the slides. 
I only think there's one small detail that's wrong. I believe that should be 91 plus 7 to get you an answer of 98. So I believe the area you calculate is in fact 91 meters squared and not 98. But the total area you get is 98. Okay, so that's plan. The next question is, so if we go to that five-step process, there's define, sorry, six-step process, define, explore, plan, do, and then the fifth step is check. Let's just quickly look at the check step. And question two is really asking you to check your answer. Your feed concentration is 1.2 kilograms per meters cubed. What is the loading rate? Is it within the typical ranges of 50 to 120 kilograms per day per square meter? That number comes from Perry's. There's the reference for you to go look that up. We've calculated this area. Does it match with what's out there in reality? Okay. So if you sub in that number, Feed concentration, 1.2 kilograms per meter cubed. That's C naught. So C naught was defined as that term. Plug that in, multiply by V, that velocity. And you'll get, after you've corrected for time, because time here was originally in minutes, we need to check up against the table in Perry's. It says kilograms per day. So just adjust your time units from minutes to days and you get a value of 74. Yes? Um, they, they just used uh, the normal set of numbers. That was maybe the, the correct way to like, do that. Right, because the actual sedimentation rate is 42 millimeters per minute. We're giving ourselves a buffer factor. Okay? You can al always verify it with the, with the half, right? So if you halve it, that will just go down. But yes, this is within the typical range. We're, we're not designing a unit that's way different from what's done in practice. Now, it's going to be hard for you to check your calculations in the future because sometimes you're going to be designing things that you've never had experience with. But that's not actually the case. You can always check your answer in an assignment. Simply Google what these devices look like. If at the very least you do not do an image search in Google for what these units look like, to make sure you haven't designed something that's far too big or far too small, you're shortchanging yourself. Okay, you have to be looking at images of these units. I will show you images sometimes in class, but if you're designing a unit, just look at images of what a centrifuge looks like, or a cyclone, or an adsorption tank. There's almost always, in those pictures online, there's always a person standing there next to it. For some reason, people like to always be in their photos. So you can always get a rough idea of the scale of this device. Okay, so at the very least, you can always check your answer to make sure it's reasonable. Or you can go to Perry's. Perry's will tell you what these units typically look like in size. So in fact, that's what the next section is about. If you go to Perry's, Perry's tells you that these devices can either be rectangular or circular. Okay, wait, this is new. We've only been assuming circles. But why can we not settle in a triangular or a square or a rectangular vessel? Can we do that? Do we have to settle in a circular vessel? Will the laws change? No. Remember that cylinder example, the cylinder in the lab, we can use a small cylinder or a big cylinder. It doesn't matter what the shape of the device is that we're settling in. All that we're concerned about is that velocity. So that interface drops at a certain height. It doesn't matter what the shape of the unit is that it's dropping in, as long as it's, it's dropping. So it's obviously easier to build circles and rectangles. We don't want to go build other shapes for ease of use. But it's absolutely possible to build, yeah. Would you get sludge buildup in the edges as well? Yeah, you would get sludge buildup, yeah. And so there's, that's one problem with a rectangular vessel, is that it's, you can't have a circular rake on a motor. Motors, 
motors turn this way. So when you go to a rectangular configuration, you need to have a conveyor belt running at the bottom. Okay. So that's why we have the two shapes, rectangular and circular, because we can build devices at the bottom to convey or move the solids away for us. Okay, so we can either have those two configurations. The most important thing that we want, though, is uniform flow in the tank with no short circuits. What I mean by that is if we draw a rectangular vessel, we're going to have my feed coming in, Q, at one end of the vessel. And I'm going to have my overflow leaving over there at the other side. So you want to make sure that there's uniform flow in the vessel and that this so these solids coming in can't escape in the overflow. And so as long as you get solids being retained at the bottom and not escaping or short-circuiting, you're fine. In a circular vessel, you feed in the center and those solids drop to the bottom. So if we're looking at the top view, those solids will spread out a little bit and they'll deposit at the bottom. And what you're hoping for is that they reach the bottom before they reach the side. Because at the top edge, around the edge of the circular tank, you've got your overflow. So you don't want short circuiting. So rectangles and circles work really well because the distances ensure that we don't get that sort short circuiting. So let me take a look at, at these visual pictures here for the rectangular settling basin. <coughs> okay, so I showed you that video at the start of the class, not only because it's an interesting unit operation, but to get you comfortable with the idea that these particles have two forces operating on them. A settling force due to gravity, and horizontal, there's another force, because we're feeding liquid in and taking liquid out again, and so that liquid flows at a horizontal velocity. Those particles then will settle with a diagonal vector. Okay? So that's rectangles. And I'll come back to the slide at the start of next class because there's an interesting issue there related to this slide, which you can go look at overnight. We'll talk about that one tomorrow. When we look at circular settling basins, we feed in the middle. Our liquid leaves at the top at the same volume, roughly the same volumetric flow rate. Those particles settle with a downward vector. But here's something really interesting. That horizontal fluid velocity is not constant. If you look at a circular sedimentation vessel, you feed all your liquid in the middle and it radiates out. And as it radiates out, the cross-sectional area that that liquid passes through gets greater and greater. And from a volumetric balance, the vo velocity in the horizontal direction is fast initially and then drops off. As you get closer to the edges, the liquid slows down. As a result of those two vectors, the solids follow that arc-shaped pattern from a theoretical perspective. Okay? So think of that. We'll pick this up in tomorrow's class and come back to these two slides.